no melter or barter in the field. Today I would like to talk to you about uh, a fundamental aspect of uh, the catalysis on oxides. And in particular, I would like to touch upon the topic of what controls reactivity. Um, I'm going to focus on one system. It's uh, the projector, not me. <laughs> <laughs> ah. It must be warming up or something. talk to you about the reactivity on oxides and concentrate on molybdenum oxide and specifically ethanol oxidation. I'll begin by telling you some background on alcohol oxidation in general. I'll present the mechanism of the reaction which will be, uh, a, uh, which will serve as background for what I really want to present. And here I will talk about kinetics and later Raman spectroscopy. But what I want to really present to you today is um, this subject of control of rate in oxidation reactions. And I'm going to present to you a framework which I believe is new for interpreting what controls the rate. And here I will present to you reactivity results and results from NEXAS spectroscopy. And the point is that I will submit to you that the rate depends on the density of empty states of the catalytic material. This density refers to the electronic uh, state. So <coughs> the, uh, it's the density of empty electronic states. And why would this be important in oxidation? Recall that oxidation is the loss of electrons. Therefore, when a substrate like ethanol gets oxidized, its electrons go to the catalyst. Therefore, the rate must be related to the ability of the catalyst to receive those electrons. And this is what I will talk to you about today. It's a little bit deep. Um, the uh, state of knowledge about ethanol, about alcohol oxidation, um, is going to be summarized here. Uh, most of the work has been done with methanol. And in this case, um, there are a, a number of well-established facts. First of all, that methoxide intermediates are involved uh, in the reaction. And this was established by Bennett and Miranda in, uh, with infrared spectroscopy. Also, the rate determining step is known. It is CH bond breaking from the adsorbed methoxide species. This was established by isotope substitution. There's also some controversy in methanol oxidation. For example, the structure sensitivity of the reaction is in question, and the reactivity dependence on the support has not been properly explained. And this is the subject I'm going to uh, touch upon today. Uh, I'm going to start with the mechanism of ethanol oxidation. This is going to set the, uh, the basic background for uh, what I will present on rate. And here I'll present to you results from in-situ laser Raman spectroscopic studies and uh, mostly steady state kinetics. I'm going to skip the transients. 
we carry out our uh, experiments in a uh, system that is diagrammed here. The main part is this sample uh, cell uh, portion. There's, of course, a gas delivery system for delivering the reactants. The ethanol is injected and vaporized. The sample is in the form of a thin wafer at the end of a rotating rod. Uh, this cell can be heated. Uh, and, uh, of course, the, the catalytic material is not exposed to the atmosphere. Light from a laser hits a sample. The scattered radiation is collected, filtered, and then passed on to a monochromator. Uh, this uh, system was designed to allow for maximum light collection, so it has no extraneous optical elements. It's pretty much the geometry as shown here. It's very simple. We employ a single short monochromator so that we do have excellent light throughput. Uh, this permits us to observe sub-monolayer quantities of absorbed species. Our group was one of the first to use this notch filter. It's an um, interference filter that is highly efficient at removing uh, the Rayleigh really light. Uh, a gas chromatograph, a chromatograph is used for analyzing the products of the reaction. The system I'm going to talk to you about is supported molybdenum oxide. The uh, supports are silica, alumina, and titania. And depending on the support, we get different structures. These are very well dispersed uh, 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 molybdenum species. On silica and on, on alumina, we have tetrahedral uh, uh, species, whereas on titania we have octahedral species. I'll summarize the evidence for this presently. Uh, we employ laser Raman spectroscopy to uh, 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 determine the vibrational uh, spectrum of the catalyst and of the sorbates. We employ uh, XF spectroscopy to determine bond distances, uh, Zanes to determine symmetry in the catalyst and the catalytic material. And finally, we tie everything together with theoretical molecular orbital calculations. Um, let me uh, be very brief about these molecular orbital calculations. Basically, the, uh, what we do is we assume a number of structures and then do calculations on these structures and see what fits. And let me just give you one example of this. Um, for molyoxide and alumina, we find that XF uh, indicates uh, that there are four molybdenum oxygen double bond, semi-double bond distances of 0.174 nanometers. Raman indicates a single molyoxygen uh, stretching frequency at 998 wave numbers. Zanes suggests that there is tetrahedral coordination and uh, according to the correlation of uh, wax relating vibrational frequency to uh, the distance, we have a predicted uh, distance uh, based on this vibrational frequency of 169 nanometers, which agrees very well with the excess results. It, only the third significant digit is off. Uh, the theoretical calculations give this best structure and uh, it predicts two moly oxygen partial double bonds at 0.173 nanometers, two partial double bonds at 0.18 nanometers. Now, XS cannot distinguish between these two close distances. So the agreement is actually very good. And then in terms of the moly O vibrational frequency, uh, we're off by 5%. So overall, there is fairly good uh, agreement. As you can see, the species is uh, uh, pseudo-tetrahedral. We have done this with the silica and the titania supports. We get very good agreement in these cases as well, but I'm not going to bore you with those details. I want to get on with the reactivity results. Here uh, is conversion and selectivity in ethanol oxidation. As expected, conversion increases with <coughs> excuse me, increasing temperature. The main product is acetaldehyde. Uh, but uh, as temperature increases, we see increasing amounts of diethyl ether, ethylene, and at the highest temperatures, COX. 
Uh, we started our mechanistic studies by doing isotope substitution experiments, and I'm showing you here the ratio of rates between ethanol that has been substitu not substituted and substituted with deuterium for the three catalyst types. And first I show results for substitution in the hydroxyl position. In this case, the ratio of rates is slightly above unity, indicating that OH bond breaking is not a rate determining in the reaction. The slightly higher values above unity can be understood from the occurrence of an equilibrium isotope effect. When we substitute in the methyl position, now the ratio of rates increases. And when we substitute in the methylene position, the ratio of rates increases further. When we had substituted in the methyl position, the selectivity to acetaldehyde increased. Whereas when we substitute in the methylene position, the selectivity to ethylene increase, increases. All of these results suggest that CH bond breaking is rate determining in the reaction. To summarize these results, uh, ethanol interacts with a site to form adsorbed ethoxide, and then this ethoxide reacts in a rate determining step through alpha hydride elimination, alpha to the oxygen, to form acetaldehyde, beta hydride elimination to form ethylene, and through a bimolecular reaction to form diethyl ether. We have measured the kinetics. And um, they are as shown here, the, uh, the rate depends on the ethanol partial pressure to an exponent that is slightly less than unity. It depends on the water partial pressure to a small negative exponent and to the oxygen partial pressure to a small positive exponent. And we have fit this with a theoretical model uh, which involves a non-uniform surface. And we get very good agreement with the theoretical, with experimental result, with only one adjustable parameter. I'll come back to the theory in just a moment. And these are the spectra of uh, adsorbed ethanol in the low, in, uh, in the low and in the high wave number range. I'm not going to bore you with uh, 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 going through each peak, but let me assure you that every single vibration has been accounted for, and. There is spectacular agreement with the ab initio calculations for ethoxide on molybdenum. So we are very confident that we have an adsorbed ethoxide species as the intermediate. Um, by the way, uh, we get this ethoxide uh, with all catalysts, silica, alumina, and titanium. We can deconvolute the high wave number region to get the symmetric and anti-symmetric uh, vibrational bands for the CH3 and the CH2 group, and we uh, can integrate the areas to obtain coverages. This is for this species. And now, if we examine the dependency of the coverage on temperature, we, so we find that the coverage decreases with increasing temperature, exactly what you would expect. And at the same time, we find that the intensity of the moly oxygen double bond increases. So the ethoxide is associated with the moly oxygen double bond. We have also measured uh, reaction hypotherms during reaction now. So we're monitoring coverage during reaction as a function of ethanol partial pressure. This is coverage in the ethoxide. And we find that the coverage duly increases with increasing ethanol partial pressure and increases with decreasing temperature. This is exactly the behavior expected for an adsorbed intermediate. Uh, we have also measured the rate, again, simultaneously with coverage, and now I'm cross-plotting coverage and rate. You can see that taking one data set, the rate increases with coverage. This is expected behavior. If you take two data sets, you see that the rate increases with increasing temperature, exactly as you would expect. And if you look at the three data sets, you see that coverage increases with decreasing temperature. Again, exactly the expected behavior. So uh, these 
measurements indicate that what we are observing, the ethoxide species, is the real intermediate in the reaction. Now, these data can give us additional information. If we take a vertical slice at constant coverage, we can get the rate at two different temperatures. Applying the Arrhenius equation to those two temperatures, we obtain an activation energy. In this case, this would be an isosteric activation energy. We can repeat the calculation at other coverages and therefore get the dependence of activation energy on the coverage. And this is shown on the next slide. As you can see, the activation energy decreases with coverage. This indicates that the surface is non-uniform. It's not a linear surface. And therefore, we need to carry out a non-uniform surface analysis. Now, I'm not going to uh, uh, dwell very much on this. I'm just going to present you the results. I will not give you the derivations. Those are available. But essentially, we carry out the analysis on the two steps, adsorption to form the ethoxide, decomposition to form the acetaldehyde, and we obtain a logarithmic a dependency of the coverage on the ethanol partial pressure uh, with a parameter F that describes the non-uniformity and we get a power rate law as expected for the uh, reaction dependence. And the actual data uh, are fit very well by these curves and these lines which represent the theoretical fits. And we get all the parameters to describe the, uh, uh, the kinetics. So, this is the mechanism. It's the same mechanism on the three supports, silica, alumina, and titanium. So, I'm sorry this has been very long as an introduction, but I wanted to establish that we have the same mechanism and we understand it very well on the three supports. Because now I want to touch on what is controlling the rate. And I'm going to present to you reactivity results and then interpret them with Zane's uh, near-edge X-ray absorption spectroscopy. Let me just briefly review the mechanism. It's two steps. The absorbed species are ethoxides. The isotope effect indicates that CH is rate determining. And the same mechanism is obtained for all three supports. Essentially, we have the absorbed ethoxide. We're breaking the alpha-CH bond to form the major species, the acetaldehyde, and this is rate determining. It's an alpha hydride transfer. Okay, comparing the rates in a Arrhenius form uh, of the three catalysts, the titania, alumina, and silica supported catalysts, we see that the rate is highest on the titania support, intermediate on the alumina, and lowest on the silica. Uh, also, uh, interestingly, the activation energies, the apparent activation energies, are uh, uh, essentially the same on all systems. The same results have been obtained with methanol oxidation. The same uh, order in the rates and the same equality of activation energies. But these results have not been properly explained and I hope to do so this evening. First of all, um, these, are TP <coughs> excuse me. these are TPR results, and we see that the titania-supported uh, material is uh, more easily reducible than the alumina-supported material, than the silica, and then plain moly oxide. These results have also uh, appeared in the literature in connection with the methanol oxidation, and uh, they are interesting because clearly um, uh, rate is correlating with reducibility. But what does that mean? I hope to give you a, a more significant uh, interpretation of these results. So uh, uh, the order in uh, reactivity was titania greater than alumina greater than silica as support. And I'm going to point out the results of a theoretical study by Weber in 1994 in which 
uh, Weber calculated the density of empty states on the same system and found this same order. Now, uh, this is uh, the basis for the interpretation of the results. But this density of empty states, what does it mean? I'm going to relate this density of empty states to the rate constant of the reaction. And the argument is as follows. First of all, we saw, well, first of all, we, have, we take the general result that a rate is equal to a rate constant times a function of concentration. Now, uh, for the same mechanism occurring with the same ethoxide intermediate, uh, this function of concentration is going to be the same. We saw that the rate was in this order. Uh, so the rate must depend on the rate constant. The rate constant can be expressed as uh, an Arrhenius equation. We saw that the activation energies were the same. Therefore, the difference in rates must reside in this pre-exponential factor. So the pre-exponential factor for titania must be larger than for alumina and for silica. That's the pre-exponential factor of the rate constant of the reaction. Now, a pre-exponential factor can be expressed as a universal frequency times a ratio of partition functions. Partition function for the activated complex and partition function for the reactant. Uh, the universal frequency and the partition function for the reactant remain the same for all three supports. So the difference in rates then can be now narrowed down to the partition function of the activated complex. Now the partition function can be further subdivided into translational, vibrational, rotational, and electronic components. For the same intermediate, the ethoxide intermediates, these partition functions for translation, vibration, and rotation cannot vary very much. Even if there are minor changes in structure resulting in different vibrational frequencies, the differences are going to be very small. And therefore, we conclude that the main contributor to the difference in rates is the electronic partition function. Now again, what is this electronic partition function? I'm talking about density of states, I'm talking about partition functions. Let me give you a picture of what this may represent. This is a potential energy diagram. It's a standard potential energy diagram, except that now I have included another coordinate which represents the density of states so this describes the progress of the reaction in the standard manner. We are looking at activation of a CH bond by a metal. This is the activated complex where the uh, hydride is transferred to the molybdenum. This is the activation energy. Now, on silica, alumina, and titania, the activation energy remained the same because essentially we're looking at the same process, CH bond breaking. However, the silica, alumina, and titania differ in that they have different pre-exponential factors and uh, uh, electronic partition functions. Essentially, the electronic partition function tells you the number of pathways that are available to cross this barrier. It is proportional to the number of electronic states that are available to accept the electrons that come with the hydrogen. So I submit that this uh, density of states is small in, uh, when the support is silica, larger when the support is alumina, and largest with titania. And this picture is what explains the reactivity results. Now, we have a means to actually measure this experimentally. And this is with Zane's spectroscopy. Uh, this spectroscopy is ideal because it probes an occupied state. It gives the electronic structure of the material. And since this is important for my presentation, I'm going to just briefly 
tell you about it. It's, uh, this is done in a synchrotron. Uh, we uh, measure for a sample uh, the uh, absorption before and after the sample and obtain the absorbance as a function of energy. And uh, the spectrum looks like this. <coughs> Excuse me. There are a number of features. There's a first feature that is called, uh, for historical reasons, the white line. Then there is a peak that marks the edge position. And then there's a post-edge region in which there are oscillations. And this uh, diagram can be understood from the electronic structure of the material. Uh, the oxide has a valence band and conduction, a valence band and a conduction band. The uh, uh, gap between these two is the energy gap, and uh, uh, the Fermi energy uh, is located in the midpoint of this energy gap and marks the beginning of absorption. Now, uh, at the very top of the conduction band, we have the vacuum level, and this is the definition of the edge when you absorb onto uh, uh, unbound states. So you, you are absorbing electrons from core levels. Uh, this is denoted E0, by the way, in, in Zane spectroscopy. We are uh, uh, absorbing then from uh, core levels and then promoting electrons to either occupied or unoccupied levels, and that's why we get this spectrum. The uh, core levels can be referenced to the vacuum or they can be referenced to the Fermi energy. The difference between the Fermi energy and the vacuum is the work function. So all of this defines the energy characteristics of the system. The important thing though is <coughs> this white line. Notice that it goes to the conduction band, the unoccupied states of the material. And this is exactly what I want to probe. Because what I'm saying is that in oxidation, the electrons that come from the substrate have to go someplace. And I'm saying that they are going into this conduction band. OK, uh, here are examples of Zane spectra to show you how useful this technique is. Uh, this is sodium molybdate. <coughs> Uh, there is the L3 and the L2 uh, 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 transitions shown here. They represent transitions from core 2P, 3 half levels, to 4D, unoccupied 4D levels. And from 2P, 1 half, to again the same 4D levels. Uh, notice that the 2P, 1 half is at a lower energy than the 2P, 3 half, so this transition requires more energy, and this L2 feature occurs at higher energy than the L3 feature. Um, this large, uh, the edge position is marked by the second peak. This very large transition is what is known as a white line. This is the transitions to the occupied, uh, to the unoccupied levels in the material. Now, very importantly, whenever one takes X-ray absorption spectra, one must be uh, cognizant of the edge jump. This represents the absolute measurement of the uh, quantity of absorbing element. The absorption is always proportional to the amount of the absorbing element, and this is measured by the edge jump. So the edge jump gives us a ways of normalizing spectra so that we don't compare intensities on an arbitrary scale. It's very important. It's, a, it's, a, it's, it's, a, it's an internal standard. Uh, here is uh, a comparison of three different materials. Again, this is Zane spectra, molyfoil, molyoxide, and sodium molybdate. We're going from a reduced material to an oxidized, to an oxidized with electropositive elements uh, situation. And uh, we see that I'm making the comparison at equal edge jumps. So this 
is important. And you always have to compare an equal edge jump to make any uh, argument about intensity. And here are the white lines. As you can see, as expected, as you go to more oxidized species, the white line increases. That is, as you become more oxidized, you have lost more electrons, so there are more levels to accept electrons. So this is ex exactly expected. The white line increases. Also, there is a shift in peak positions. As you go to the more oxidized systems, the energies increase, 18, 20, 21. This is a chemical shift. As you become more oxidized, it becomes more difficult to remove electrons from the core of the molecule. So this is all expected. Uh, again, this is veins, and now I'm comparing veins for sodium molybdate and molyoxide. Again, as an example of the power of veins uh, to uh, give you information about symmetry. In sodium molybdate, the molybdenum is tetrahedral, in molyoxide is pseudo-octahedral. The energy splitting between the two components of the white line is 1.8 EVs in sodium molybdate and 3.0 EVs in molyoxide. This is a significant difference. Also, you will note that in sodium molybdate, the second peak is of higher intensity than the first, whereas the order is reversed here. This is explained from the electronic structure. In tetrahedral species, we have such an energy level diagram with T2 levels higher than E. The T2 levels are threefold degenerate, and therefore the higher energy peak is more intense than the lower energy peak. In the case of octahedral geometry, now the T and E levels are inverted. The T levels uh, are at the bottom, they're threefold degenerate, more numerous than the twofold, therefore the first peak now is more intense. Furthermore, the crystal splitting in tetrahedral uh, symmetry is smaller than in octahedral, and that is why the splitting here is smaller than the splitting there. So as you can see, veins can give a lot of information about structure. And uh, uh, actually, these results have been presented by others in the past, uh, notably by uh, Bayer and collaborators, who have established that for tetrahedral coordination, you do get a small splitting, and for octahedral, a large splitting in agreement. Uh, our results are in agreement with theirs. So for our titania, alumina, and silica-supported materials, we get from the splitting which is small and small here, and large there, tetrahedral, tetrahedral, and octahedral geometry, which I had presented at the very beginning. Now, let me return to this fundamental question, and I'm almost through here. Uh, how is rate in oxidation related to the density of unoccupied states? This is the structure of intermediates. We are doing a hydride transfer to the catalytic center, and this has to involve an electron transfer, the, uh, uh, the electrons that are associated with the hydrogen atom to form the uh, intermediate, which rearranges to form acetaldehyde. But then this electron transfer must involve the unoccupied levels is what I am suggesting. And if this is so, then the rate must depend on the area of the white line for the silica, alumina, and titanium supported materials. Now we have a big problem because we did the measurements for the silica, alumina, and titanium. And here are here is the L3 position. It is very small because the moly oxide is very highly dispersed. We're using 1%, very low concentrations. And therefore, we cannot measure an edge jump. It's all white line. There's no edge, there's no experimentally measurable edge jump to normalize 
these peaks. But what we did was a very clever thing. We added a, an internal standard, which is barium sulfate. This is an inert material at oxidizing conditions. And by setting this uh, 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 signal constant, then we were able to normalize the areas internally. And with this, we obtained the results shown here that the alumina has a larger area than the silicon, the titania has the largest area, and the peak areas are in this order. So this confirms our expectations and uh, is in agreement with the results. So uh, it's these levels which are able to take on the electrons in an oxidation reaction which I submit are important in determining reaction rates. So uh, the rate which follows this order can be explained by the availability of empty electronic states in the metal oxide support complex. So to end then, uh, the rate determining step in ethanol oxidation is alpha hydride abstraction from adsorbed ethoxide groups. The kinetics are described by a non-uniform surface model. And the rate on uh, the molyon titania, uh, alumina, and uh, silica depends on the density of empty states. I think this is, uh, this may be a, a useful concept, because instead of screening catalysts for a reaction, for example, one could do the uh, NEXAFS measurement. In certain cases, for example, in a combinatorial uh, approach where you have multiple samples on some substrate, it, it would be easier to measure the spectroscopic property rather than measuring a reaction rate. So this could have some use in screening. It can also give um, some utility in interpreting results. For example, if the uh, rate does not depend on the uh, on the density of empty states, uh, then maybe the mechanism is uh, nucleophilic instead of electrophilic. So you can uh, get inverse deductions about the mechanism. I'd like to acknowledge the uh, people who were involved in the work. There are various students, uh, some collaborators in Japan who helped me with the excess measurements and funding from the NSF. Thank you for your attention. Do we have any questions? Yes, please. I noticed that uh, diethyl lever uh, is one of your products also, which is a normal dehydration uh, product of two molecules of ethanol. Is yes. it a surface reaction here? And if so, how does it occur? Uh, the, eth the diethyl ether, uh, we did not investigate uh, very deeply because it was a side product. Um, as, you, as you say, the ethoxides form, the hydrogens from the OH groups go onto oxygen and those uh, dehydrate to form water. And this occurs in, in what we believe is an equilibrium step. Water is in equilibrium with OH groups on the surface. We deduce this from the kinetics of the mechanism when we include the effect of water, and we have done the water partial pressure effect. So I think it's, uh, in this case, a simple uh, acid-base type of mechanism for the uh, dehydration. Yes? You talked about the preference for the octahedral coordination in the molybdenum in the titania samples. Do you have any feeling from a structure standpoint of why that would be? Uh, actually, actually, I do not have a good uh, insight on why on titania this structure would prefer to be octahedral. Um, it is a finding that has been uh, reported by others that on titania Molly prefers to be uh, octahedral. Have you done any? Actually, on the pure molly.
without support? Um, if you're running without support, yeah. yes. Um, what kind of comparison with the support attached? It, it's somewhat completely different. We did not uh, include uh, unsupported moly oxide in these studies of Zane, but we did do some early work on um, kinetics uh, with unsupported moly. It's quite uh, different. Uh, for example, if we increase the loading of uh, moly oxide, on silica even. Um, we form small crystallites of moly oxide at higher loadings and uh, we get a certain relationship between uh, say activity and temperature. But you extrapolate this and it doesn't really extrapolate very well to bulk moly oxide. Bulk moly oxide is somewhat different in our, in our experience. Is there any exchange hydrogen deuterium under the conditions, or is it irreversible? Um, we, when we did the isotopic experiments, um, we did not see exchange in the CH positions and in the OH uh, position. Uh, we did not actually tried to measure it. We were just looking at the conversion. There well may have been for that because the uh, alcohol uh, uh, absorption on the surface is equilibrated, so you would expect exchange. Not the CH position, so because those are rate determining. Once they happen, they don't go back.